Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Caritas. Today is Friday, May 1st, 2020. Thank you so much for joining me. Title of today's podcast, it's just a weekly wrap-up. That's all we're going to do today. Keep this one a little short. Enjoy the weekend, hopefully. Uh, So market performance, White House had a press conference for the first time in a year, so we'll highlight some of those talking points today. Talk a little bit further about jobless claims, just to just to sort of make the full circle on that for the week. And then to maybe talk about some of the global protests that are likely to start uh, reigniting once these economies start to quote-unquote open up. Even if they don't open up, I think it's likely to occur regardless. But first, to market performance, we have stocks continuing their reversal to the downside. Dow Jones Industrial Average gave back 2.6%. The S&P 500 gave back 2.8%. NASDAQ 100 down 3%. The Russell 2000, the small cap index, was also down, I believe, around 4%. Uh, So not a good day on Wall Street. Of course, this is the beginning of a new month. So on the back of April, April being one of the best months ever, people might just be taking profits. And again, a couple days does not make a trend. So, you know, a lot of people are thinking, okay, it's May already. Yes, we know it's May. We talked about that adage yesterday, sell in May, go away. That's a possibility. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But time will tell. Time will tell. That's why you got to stay diversified. That's why you have to pay attention. But the markets were down. Japanese markets closed down 2.8% across the board, across the pond in Europe, down 2% as well. Australian markets got beat up down 5% to close for the day. WTI, $19.78 a barrel. Brent, $26.56 a barrel. Natural gas down slightly, $1.88 per million British thermal units. Gold and silver relatively unchanged from yesterday's podcast, 16 98 per ounce for gold, $14.96 per ounce for silver. Uncle Sam's 10-year treasury note yielding 0.64%. So a little bit higher on Uncle Sam's treasury yield on the 10-year. White House press secretary, the first in a year with the new press secretary, Kaylee McEnany. I think she did a decent job, especially for her first go-around, but of course, this really wasn't her first circus. I mean, she's her first rodeo. I mean, she's on Fox News and the other channels all the time, so she's used to taking questions from the media, but of course, being center stage in the White House briefing room is a different environment, but she handled herself well. She's articulate, well-spoken, basically made the claim uh, outright when asked the question, will you lie to us? And she said, no, I will never lie to you. And of course, this is on the back of the previous White House uh, press secretaries who were known to bend the truth and just simply outright lie. And of course, the last press secretary, Stephanie Grisham, she never gave a press conference uh, or a press briefing. So, you know, for the Trump administration to sort of pat themselves on the back for being the most open or transparent administration just doesn't quite pass the smell test. Now, one of the interesting things out of this press conference, and we haven't focused a lot on this story. I know it's in the media with uh, General Michael or Colonel uh, Michael Flynn and all that jazz with the FBI, the memos coming out, the investigations and all this, that and the other stuff, right? We know here, we have covered these types of things before. There is a two-tier justice system in this country, all right? What is interesting is how the Trump administration, through the president's tweets and now through his press secretary, Kaylee McEnany, calling these memos, these handwritten memos from the FBI, a miscarriage of justice. I think that's being hyperbolic. I think that's being overdramatic because at the crux of these memos, some of them anyway, again, I haven't dug too deeply into these stories, but I just want to scratch the surface with what she mentioned during the press conference or the press briefing and what she was pushing back on some of the reporters in the room. Because she said, well, I think it's a miscarriage of justice when you have handwritten memos, handwritten notes from FBI agents that say, we want to cause Michael Flynn to lie. We want him to lie. Uh, To me, that is not a miscarriage of justice. Have you ever watched an episode of Dateline? That's the real stuff. Even have you ever watched an episode of Law & Order? That's what all of these detectives and all of these investigators do to a suspect, to somebody they're 
interrogating somebody they are interviewing. Let's see if we can catch them in a lie. Let's see if we can get them to lie. Because then that throws their credibility out the window. Oh, there's that word again, credibility, that we like to talk about here at the Capitol News. Maybe it, you, maybe you're somebody who committed a crime by yourself. Maybe there's a partner in crime or suspected, right? All right, now you got a partner in crime. There's two of you. What do they do? All right, Jim, we're going to put you in this room. We're going to interview you. And then somebody else takes Bob and they put him in the other room and somebody goes and interviews him. You ask questions. What happened? Tell me your side of the story. Then the detectives get together and they say, okay, here's what Jim said and here's what Bob said. Do those stories jive or is somebody lying? And now they pick one and they try to pit them against each other. Try to catch them in a lie. That's what they do. So this miscarriage of justice to me is overdramatic. It's overdramatic. If they planted evidence against the guy, that's completely different. But trying to catch him in a lie or trying to get him to lie, however you want to phrase it, makes no difference to me. That's what they do. And this guy, Michael Flynn, used to be the head of the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency. So he's no little grandma, helpless grandma here. This guy knows how to handle himself. At least he should. He should not have been intimidated by FBI interrogators. All right? He wasn't waterboarded. He was interviewed. Furthermore, this is the same White House who fired him. Vice President Michael Pence said that Flynn lied to him, conveyed that information to the president. The president used that, at least as one of his reasons, for justifying the firing of Michael Flynn. He lied to the vice president. The vice president told me he lied to him. He's got to go. Now he wants to play, oh, woe is me, deep state picking on Michael Flynn. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. Not with this. This ain't enough. If there's dirty cops in the FBI, get them. Get them out of there. Expose it. We're all about the truth and justice here. But to say that this is a miscarriage of justice because FBI agents wanted to get Michael Flynn to lie or catch him in a lie, no, that's ridiculous. Turn on an episode of Dateline, okay? There's pro, I mean, it's basically 24-7 on some of these stations over and over again where they're interviewing detectives. You actually see the footage. You see their conversation. Yeah, we want to see if this guy would lie to us. We want to see if we can get him to lie. Check out his story. It's not a miscarriage of justice. That's an investigation. And if they did something wrong, then that's for Michael Flynn and his defense attorneys to write, to explain to the jury Here's what they did. Here's their abuse of power. Here's their real miscarriage of justice and allow a jury to decide. Furthermore, Michael Flynn pleaded guilty. Okay, so don't forget those facts of the case, too. Now, what's interesting with all of this is the politics of it, right? Donald Trump is very savvy when it comes to his political instincts and understanding his base. He talks out of both sides of his mouth, right? He fired this guy for lying. Now, oh, there's a memo from the FBI trying to catch him in a lie. And all hell is breaking loose. It's a miscarriage of justice. I'm not buying it. But President Trump knows his base. He knows the animosity. He knows the belief of people with, with regards to the deep state. This is a conspiracy. They're just trying to get Trump by any means possible. Yada, yada, yada. It's the same song and dance that he played three years ago. And he's doing it again. Same thing with the blame game that's starting to really heat up, which we warned about weeks ago, in regards to China. It's looking for an out. It's looking for a political play. And it might turn into policy. Like I said, I have no problem going after China. But just understand the consequences, okay? This is the same playbook. You wanted to play, you know, blame Mexico last time more heavily, build that wall. Mexicans are going to pay for it. Now it's probably going to be more so. We're going to blame China. We're going to slap more tariffs on them. We're going to do X, Y, Z pulling our supply chains out of there. Maybe we'll go somewhere else into Asia. Maybe we'll bring them back here. Who knows? But that is going to be the political argument. This plays to his base. This is 2020. All right? There is no draining of the swamp, ladies and gentlemen. It's been three going on three and a half years. We are spending money that we do not have to prop up institutions that should have went into bankruptcy because they squandered their resources. The president is more than happy to give them the cash, your money, and money that's printed, <clears throat> funny money, that you're going to have to pay for with inflation, stagflation, hyperinflation, that your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren are going to have to pay for. That is not draining of the swamp. 
that is increasing it exponentially. Exponentially. There is no draining of the swamp. Understand this. So I thought that was interesting. Another thing I thought was interesting from the briefing this afternoon was the fact that Kaylee McEnany said, you know, I think she was asked the question, will you be doing these every day? Because that's typically the norm. She said, oh, well, no, I, you know, we'll, we'll figure out some sort of schedule. We'll do something this, that, or the other. Now, now, put on your politics hat, put on your cynical hat. How do, what do you think is going to happen here? Wouldn't you, think, wouldn't you think that the only time that there's going to be some sort of press briefing is when there's quote-unquote positive news for the Trump administration or something positive for them to spin out there? If it's bad news, she's probably not going to show her head. That's my guess. I hope I'm wrong. I hope she comes out every day and explains what's taking place. I hope these journalists, these reporters, suffer questions about the oversight of the $500 billion that is basically, that is basically in the palm of the hand of the president and Stephen Mnuchin, the secretary of the treasury. Where's the oversight? Where's the oversight? Why is the inspector general, why has he been fired? Why is he kicked out? That's our money. Why, why can't we see what's going on with it? I'd like an answer to that question. You think we'll get one? I doubt it. I doubt it. So we'll see what happens, but I just wanted to highlight those things. And if there's some, again, if the FBI or any other investigative team really carries out a miscarriage of justice, then they need to be held to account. And that person who was on the other side of it needs to be exonerated. They need to have their day in court. Those facts need to be made present. We're all about the truth here. We're all about justice. But this, to me, as it stands now, is just a bunch of political posturing because there's a little bit of information that came out that allows one side of the argument to spin it in a way that they want to that fits their narrative. And how convenient it is that it's taking place now in 2020 with only a few months to go before the election. Now, on the other front here, back to the economic side of things. Obviously, yesterday we had an, an additional 3.8 million Americans file for unemployment claims. That was, of, of course, what took place last week because there's a week lag as to when those numbers come out. So we imagine that those numbers will continue through the following week and then start to level off a little bit. But the other thing that is interesting, because that takes us to about 30 million Americans, a little bit more than that, over the past six weeks who have filed for unemployment insurance. But there's another data metric that you also have to follow, and that's continued claims. Continued claims. So how many of those people who have just filed for unemployment insurance remain unemployed? Okay. Now, again, to the Federal Reserve's website, we have a figure of about 18 million Americans. All right. But, but the last data point was provided for Saturday of April 18th. So there's a couple week lag here. Why? What's going on? So we're going to find out hopefully next week, maybe over the weekend, this will be updated and we'll see how many of those Americans remain unemployed. I imagine this number will be rather significant. The other interesting thing when it comes to this, and we have discussed this over the past couple of weeks as well, because I believe a lot of these government programs that are out there are designed to assist the government's numbers to not look so bad. Okay, when you have the payment protection plan and all these other small business loans, yada, yada, yada. Of course, one of those conditions is you're going to take the loan. If you want it to be forgiven, you have to hire or at least keep on all of your employees. You got to either bring them back out of unemployment and put them back on the payroll or do not lay them off. Well, all that's going to do is make the unemployment figures look better. But it doesn't mean that those people are working. In fact, a lot of them aren't. Now, of course, there's some that are, but there's going to be a lot of Americans who are not working. Yet they are not counted as unemployed because that small business or whatever size business really has the loan and they are keeping their people on the payroll. All right. So 
how does that tie into the continued claims? Well, if a lot of people who are already unemployed and are part of that 30 million Americans, well, if these plans from the government actually start to quote unquote work and all of that money is making its way out into the system for these smaller mid-sized businesses to bring their people back out of unemployment, then we're going to see a huge drop in continued claims. That's going to say to us, okay, this money is making its way through and the employer, employers are making good on it by bringing their people out of unemployment. However, on the other side of this, if that doesn't take place, meaning continued claims continues to stay at elevated numbers, and again, this chart too is off the charts, then we know that those plans, those programs from the government are not working. So we're going to continue monitoring these numbers, initial jobless claims and continued claims over the course of the coming weeks. We already know there's a lag. We already know that the government programs have not been smooth sailing, pretty much anything but. We know a lot of larger corporations have been getting that money. You know, again, these are the larger corporations who had every opportunity to save up to maintain some sort of safety net for themselves. They squandered it, but nevertheless, they line up and they get bailed out. Major corporations, hedge funds, private equity. Again, folks, that's the swamp. That's the swamp because the way they're getting this money is being buddy-buddy with all of their banking buddies and buddy-buddy with all of the politicians who they have in their pocket. That's the swamp. That's the swamp. Or am I mistaken? Correct me if I'm wrong. But those are the guys getting the money. Mom and pops are getting squeezed. They are getting squeezed. And I saw some interesting data also today. I think it was, oh, I wish I should have written it down and I forgot I was looking at it earlier. About 15%, maybe closer to 20% of small businesses don't even have a month's worth of cash reserves to keep them sustained. So if something happens, like what's taking place now, they're out of business for a month, they're pretty much out of business forever. About 20%. About 20%. You take this out a couple more months, now you got almost half of small businesses if this prolongs to two months because they're going to run out of any type of savings that they have. Now, of course, a lot of this not, is not necessarily because of poor management, but it could just be because of the nature of the business. Razor thin margins, those types of things. Just the nature of the business, depending on the industry. But nevertheless, the heart and soul of this economy is small and mid-sized businesses. So much of the employment that is, take, that is obviously in this country is in those respective firms, small, mid-sized businesses. So all of this quote-unquote assistance isn't making it to them. But we'll find out if it starts to get to them by monitoring the initial jobless claims coupled with the continued claims. So we'll keep you updated on that. Might do some capital economics presentations. This is just the same so you can see the, the data that I'm looking at visually as well. And then just to wrap things up here for the weekend, I know we've talked about it a lot, but I think we're going to start seeing them once again, and this goes back to the global protests. These are not transitory. They are history in the making. We're seeing again in Lebanon the banks burning, protests, people starving. You know, you see massive lines in Venezuela, which we talked about a little bit yesterday, with regards to their fuel shortages. I mean, you got people lined up for miles, you know, sort of reminiscent of what was taking place here in the United States in the 1970s. You have people I saw today in South Africa on foot, which just looked like it stretched for miles, of people walking to a food bank. To a food bank. Now, hopefully food can continue to make its way to these food banks. What happens if it doesn't? What happens if it stops? What happens if there are massive shortages, which we're starting to see? So we're sowing the seeds to a lot of this, right? The meat processing plants that cannot be opened, you know, or they're not going to be functioning the destroying of pigs, the destroying of chickens. I imagine cattle will be next to some degree. Farmers driving over lettuce fields, and I'm sure others, with their tractors just destroying it. Yet Meanwhile, people are starving to death. It's topsy-turvy. It's a topsy-turvy world. You can't make heads or tails a lot of this stuff. But people were at the end of their rope before the onset of COVID-19. It's gotten that much worse since, I think, well, I know I've heard some stories about protesters 
really chomping at the bit once again in Hong Kong, just ready to go back at it. And of course, the Hong Kong government is trying to impose as many laws and restrictions as possible so that they can maintain social distancing. Well, you can't have all of those riots and protests like they had before under social distancing. So this is going to get very hairy very quickly. And again, I am still amazed that Hong Kong has not collapsed. I am still amazed by this. So who, God only knows what's going on behind the scenes to keep them propped up. But I, I just cannot believe that they have yet to collapse. But if these protesters come back, and I believe that they will, look out. Because it's going to be worse than it was before. Why? Because it is worse now than it was before. There is no V-shaped recovery. You might get one in the stock market if you're lucky, if you're long stocks. But in the economy, no. Especially not on the global economy. This is a huge ship. It is not nimble. This is not a light switch. That's what a lot of people seem to think. That's what a lot of the crackheads and frat bros on Wall Street seem to think. That it's a light switch. They find a therapy, no problem. They get a vaccine, no problem. Everything will go back to normal. No. No, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. Nor was it sustainable. Nor was that system prior sustainable. So this is going to be a big wake-up call. Remember, everything's a process. You don't go from a deflationary environment to an inflationary one overnight. But again, you can have both, and we will see both. Lower prices in some areas, higher prices in others. The question is, how does it affect your pocketbook? Because if it's on food, if it's on utilities, if it happened to get a big rise back up in commodity prices, well, if you start spending a bigger chunk of your income, which might have gone down too because you might have lost your job, took a pay cut, whatever, you're going to have to devote a larger portion of your income to those goods because that's what you need to live. So you might have prices of things like laptop, computers, iPhones, a whole bunch of gadgets and gizmos that people used to splurge on now those prices are going down because there's no demand for them because you've got to spend more of your income on the bare necessities. So the question becomes, yeah, there's deflation in some of these things, lower prices, you could say, but what difference does it make? If you're not, if you're not buying them, what do you care what the price is, right? It's like right now, nobody's driving anywhere because you're not allowed to, but we have low gasoline prices. So what? You can't use them. You have low airline tickets. So what? Nobody's going anywhere. Just because the price is low doesn't necessarily make it a good thing. You can't use it. So you're going to see deflation, lower prices in other areas. You're going to see the inflation, higher prices in others. The question is, to what degree and when? It's a process, like everything else. That's a weekly wrap-up. Thank you so much for joining me this week and today, obviously. Hope to catch you guys here next week. If there's some sort of breaking news, I'll do my best to do a week ahead segment. Otherwise, you will catch me back here on Monday. Please enjoy your weekend. Please like, share, subscribe, get the word out, leave your comments. We do love hearing from you. Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capital News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.